Absolutely delighted to be talking today to Sir Ronald Cohen. As you mentioned, uh, Ronnie is a philanthropist, a venture capitalist, a private equity investor, and a social innovator who's driving forward the global impact revolution. He co-founded Apex Partners at the age of 26, having come to the UK as a refugee from Egypt at the age of 11. Uh, and for nearly two decades, his groundbreaking initiatives have catalyzed global efforts to drive private capital to serve social and environmental goods. So, Ronnie, it's a delight to have you here today. You are chair of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, and you recently uh, wrote a book, which is not yet published, will be published on July the 2nd, uh, called Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change. There we have the book, a very nice cover. Hearts for us all, sharing your love with us all today. Um, so, Ronnie, thank you for joining us on the leadership stage. I'd like to start by inviting you to tell us what, what the book is about and what you are trying to do in this world. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Great pleasure to be here with, uh, with all of you. Um, it's clear to me, as uh, probably is to everybody uh, in, in our audience, uh, that all the hopes we've had over past uh, decades that uh, we would succeed in reducing inequality and solving um, environmental issues, all of those hopes have been dashed. And we, despite uh, the encouragement of entrepreneurship, despite uh, the help that venture capital and private equity have given people from modest backgrounds to make a lot of money, these uh, gaps between rich and poor have widened. And so the book, Diana, addresses the question of how do we change our system so that it isn't self-defeating. To have a system today where companies create negative social and environmental consequences, which governments then tax us all uh, in order to try to remedy them, uh, clearly doesn't make any sense. And the book addresses the question of whether we mustn't take another step now from Adam Smith, invisible, hand uh, of, of markets to bringing impact alongside profit at the center of our economic system, in a way bringing the invisible heart of markets, which uh, harks back um, to the cover of the book, the invisible heart of markets to guide their invisible hand. Thank you. That's, that's a a really important way, I think, to think about this. We want to mainstream this so that our economic systems uh, produce the goods that I, I think and hope we would all like to see. And how do you propose that we should go about doing this? So it's obvious, uh, Diana, uh, that it's already uh, underway. Values have changed. We find uh, young people especially buying products from companies whose values they share and issuing the products of, of companies uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that they don't uh, like uh, because of their uh, behavior. We see investors channeling more than $30 trillion now to companies which are achieving some type of environmental or social good. That's 15% uh, of all investable assets in, in the world. Uh, but what is missing at the moment is adding measurement to that intention. And I believe that the COVID is shaking our beliefs and our assumptions and opens up the opportunity for us to do after COVID-19 what we did in 1929 in measuring profit. 1929, after the crash, people sat up and said, can it really be that we've been investing without really understanding what profit companies are making? Because each company, as you probably, as you definitely know, but most of our audio, audience probably knows, uh, most companies, all companies then, chose their own accounting policies, their own accounting firms, and, and there were no auditors. And after 1929, we standardized the counting principles. We brought auditors to verify the information that uh, companies were uh, publishing. And I believe that after COVID-19, if we do the same for impact, 
if we begin to have impact weighted financial accounts for companies that reflect both their financial and their impact performance, then it really will be a watershed between our system of the last 250 years where we've optimized risk and return to a new uh, paradigm of risk, return and impact, where we achieve not only profit, but also an improvement in lives and the environment. Can we drill down a little bit on that system that you're proposing? What exactly is it that we are measuring? Who decides what we should measure? And how do we go about doing it? So in the same way that uh, we measure the profit that companies create, and we have established accounting principles for measuring that profit, and of course in the tech area there have been big uh, debates around recognition of income and all sorts of judgments have had to be made about how these accounting principles are shaped. In that same way we have to measure the impact that companies create through their products, through their operations and through their employment on people and planet. And that measurement is already going on in many organizations across the world. But rather like 1929, it hasn't been standardized so that comparisons between companies can be dependably made. And so the watershed between risk return and risk return impact is actually the mandatory publication by companies of impact weighted financial accounts that initially sit alongside their financial accounts over time will probably become the established basis for financial analysts to value companies but in the meantime would sit alongside the financial accounts that we've all got used to and who would determine the metrics that we would use i think You've referred to us being in the time of COVID, obviously. We're also in the time of protests on the street around voices that are not heard uh, in our world today. And I worry uh, when we're designing a new system like this uh, that there will be great challenges in including all the relevant voices in defining the issues that we measure uh, and how we go about measuring them? Well, Diana, there are obviously many challenges uh, uh, to be met on the way to having an impact accounting system uh, that can rival our financial accounting system. Uh, but our financial accounting system has taken nine decades to perfect. Uh, it's in 1933, four years after the Great Crash, uh, that legislation was passed to establish uh, a new set of accounting principles and, and to bring auditors into uh, the picture. As a first step, uh, people in the AI area, uh, which many of our audience uh, come from, uh, are very much aware that we have new tools at our disposal to measure product impact or employment impact or environmental impact. And in the environmental area, for instance, we've got four de decades of scientific work on metrics. And you'll be amazed by the comparisons that you can make. On the basis of public information today, you can see that Exxon, for example, and I'm not advocating that anybody should invest in fossil fuel companies, but for those who have investments in fossil fuel companies, which is still, sadly, a very large number of, uh, of, of people, uh, doesn't the fact that Exxon creates $40 billion of annual environmental damage versus BP creating eight and Shell 12 matter to an investor? On the basis of public information, we will publish later this year, we is a, an effort I chair, which is incubated at Harvard Business School, the accounts of 2,500 companies waited for their environmental impact. And next year, 
we will add to that the beginnings of approaches to measure both product impact and employment impact. But one thing I'm absolutely convinced of is that this is totally feasible. And to answer your question, just as we have accounting standards boards today that deal with the financial accounting, we will have an accounting standards board, hopefully a global one, to set these impact uh, principles uh, down. And they will get perfected and technology will be a great help uh, in making sure that uh, the measurement of the impacts of companies and the valuations that uh, we place on these positive and negative impacts are done as objectively uh, as is humanly possible. What you're advocating, um, as you say, I, I'm sure is feasible. Uh, it is potentially complicated, but I, I take your point that it's, it's a system we need to devise and uh, get used to. Um, what happens once that's in place in terms of people putting money behind you know, the right companies, as it were. Is this just an a values neutral information system, which then enables investors to put their money behind uh, companies with the highest positive impact or the least negative impact? Or is there something in addition that would uh, incentivize investors to do that? So the impact accounting system must be objective. Uh, incentives have to come for government. Let's take the inequalities which underlie a lot of the protests that uh, we have seen uh, in, in many countries over the last uh, year or two and in the United States after uh, the uh, tragic uh, murder of George Floyd. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, ethnic diversity and gender diversity uh, and other types of diversity, uh, inclusion of, uh, of those who have been cast out of society, like released uh, prisoners and those whom uh, nature uh, has uh, uh, allowed to uh, be born with, uh, with the challenges, physical challenges of one kind or, or another. There is a cost to the economy that comes from excluding uh, these individuals. And there's a benefit to the economy that comes from including them. And so accounting principles will be set down to measure the impact of employment and to put a value on the impact that a company creates. So that a company which uh, invests very little in training, the sorts of uh, uh, people we've been talking about, we're going to come out of this crisis with a very large number of unemployed people. I hear numbers from uh, very respected economists that 40% of those who are unemployed in this crisis may not uh, find their own uh, job back. Uh, we're going to have to address employment in a different way. Uh, we're going to have to train people for new jobs. The technology revolution um, has already led to a huge rotation in the skills that are required uh, for somebody to have a successful uh, career. And coming out of every crisis, we see inequalities increase rather than reduce. The stimuluses that our governments put in place tend to help the big and the powerful companies and financial institutions because that's the way to get the quickest result. But they forget the most vulnerable in our society who time and again are hit hardest. And so the tools of impact investment, the measurement of impact, the desire of investors to be able to discriminate between two companies' impacts, just as they can discriminate between two companies' profits, uh, those are the sorts of issues that we have to solve coming out of this crisis if we want uh, this decade uh, to mark a turning point uh, for our societies and for our environment. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think 
one thing that is interesting is a lot of the conjecture around building out of this crisis suggests that a greener rebirth could also be a more jobs intensive rebirth. So uh, that's a win-win situation. But I'd like to ask you a little bit about the uh, win-lose uh, uh, situation. So what? how does one think about, uh, I'll give you two examples and you, uh, they're slightly different, but there's one where the financial uh, return is reduced uh, because of the other types of positive impact. That's, that's one situation. A second situation is uh, whether between the different types of impact, there might be a conflict. So for, uh, an example often given is Tesla, which is uh, fantastic environmentally, but has pretty dubious um, policies towards its workers, for example. Yeah. So how do you go about thinking about those things? So very good question. The first thing is an impact accounting uh, system, like a financial accounting system, has to take into account all positive and negative impacts. And so if you were to weight uh, Tesla for the reduction in carbon emissions that are achieved by its uh, vehicles, uh, but found that uh, some of their other practices created uh, costs, um, the two would net one another off and the balance would depend on how great the respective impact was. So the first thing is it needs to be inclusive. But underlying um, uh, the earlier part of your question, Diana, is a preconceived notion that uh, somehow making money and doing good are in conflict and that there has to be a cost. And I think the big discovery that is going to emerge from this impact revolution, which I see as a revolution that is going to be as far reaching as the tech revolution, uh, which I was privileged to play a, a, a small role in, uh, the tech revolution disrupted our norms, our ways of living. Uh, tech became the water on which every ship has to sail today. And the impact ship is no different. We will be able to use new business models to achieve better impact and better profit by trying to optimize risk return and impact than if we just optimize risk return. And if I may give an example out of the AI world, uh, there's an Israeli company called Orcam. And the founders of Orcam were the founders of Mobileye, which sold out uh, for $15 billion to Intel, um, basically artificial intelligence for driverless cars. The aunt of one of the two founders was going blind and asked the founder to help her. Six uh, years ago or so, uh, he decided that the technology had reached the stage where it could help blind people. And so Orcam developed a set of spectacles which a blind or visually impaired person can wear. There are 35 million blind people in the world and about 250 million visually impaired people. So about 300 million people could be helped by a pair of spectacles with something like a memory stick hanging on the side, which whispers into the ear of the wearer the page of the book you're holding or the banknotes you're holding or whatever. Now that's an impact venture, I'm sure you'd agree. The company has raised money at a $600 million valuation. So optimizing risk return and impact for them has certainly worked out. But if you put on an impact lens, you ask yourself an additional question. How can my technology help the maximum number of people in the world? And it brings you to a surprising conclusion, because the answer to that question is, what if you gave those spectacles to the 800 million adults in the world who are illiterate? What would they do to the lives of an individual, um, of these individuals, uh, to be able to read? What would the impact be on their economies or on the whole world? It then defines a market for you of over a billion people. 
you've redefined what an impact unicorn is. It's a company which isn't just worth a billion dollars, but improves the lives of a billion people. And in this way, I think we will disrupt the models of business just as technology did. I, I hope that you are right, uh, and I do see there's a, there's a lot of movement in that direction. Uh, I don't want to be a pedant, but I'm, I just wondered for this audience whether you can talk a little bit more about that, the process. I mean, there is a concern over being asked to do more and more and more and report on more and more and more. So I see you know, public companies now that do sustainability reports that are already 90 pages long, covering lots and lots of things. This is a huge investment for them. And again, you know, times are not easy at the moment. Do you think this is actually feasible to build this into the DNA of companies at a very early stage as well, uh, startups and the like, so that they can uh, easily manage the requirements? I think it's in the interest of companies to do so uh, and I'll explain, I'll explain why but I also think it's a major opportunity for companies uh, in uh, developing uh, their business models and finding new avenues for growth and profitability to espouse impact. The first interest that companies have is investors and talent are going in that direction. Uh, 31 trillion, as I have mentioned, is already issuing certain types of companies, uh, coal companies, uh, fossil fuel uh, companies, more uh, generally tobacco companies, uh, sometimes gambling, alcohol, and, and, and so on. 31 trillion is well over the tipping uh, point. Um, it's growing at uh, between, uh, I don't know, 15 and 20 percent a year, ESG investing. Um, I heard uh, the other day uh, from somebody at BlackRock that uh, according to their figures uh, in this year to date, ESG investments, environmental, social and governance uh, investments outperformed uh, other investments. So investors have understood that the changing preferences of consumers, a lot of them young consumers, endanger the profitability of the companies in which they invest. And so if companies want to preserve their consumer base and their investor base, they have an interest in doing so. But just as vividly, all of us who have children on this, uh, uh, you know, on this webinar are aware of their changing values. Uh, the next generation does not just want to make money. It's looking for more meaning and meaning for it means improving lives and improving the environment. So if talent begins to desert companies that are not doing good and doing well, their future is also going to be threatened. And those who don't lead in, in, in this field uh, will have a hard a hard time. Now, then shift to saying, well, okay, we understand that there's a defensive need for it, but look at it from the point of view of opportunity. If you can define your market as over a billion people rather than 300 million, doesn't that bring you to the conclusion that uh, what Michael Porter referred to in the book has called the shared value is really what the future of growth and profitability is going to be about. We actually can help to bring solutions. Business people are better placed today than governments, which are very cash trapped and very indebted to help to bring solutions to the almost existential social and certainly existential environmental issues uh, that, uh, that we face. And so if for those who come from the investment world, the efficient frontier of investment is more attractive for risk, return and impact, then the companies that succeed in doing that will attract the consumers, the investors and the talent. So we shouldn't view it as simply a burden. You could argue, and indeed people did argue in the 30s in front of Congress, 
that bringing standardized financial accounting principles and auditors would be the end of American capitalism. You can argue that it's a burden, but hasn't having a dependable financial accounting system led to a massive expansion of financial markets? Could you have expected financial markets to grow to the 200 trillion of today if nobody could be sure what a profit uh, a company was actually uh, making and if you couldn't compare between companies? And I think we will look back on this period post COVID-19 and we will say, my God, did people before then really just invest while looking at the profit companies made and that's all? Thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of this part of the session. Uh, we're going to take questions as we move into the second part. We're going to have a slight break before that. Just if you could say one very short word about what the public can do to promote this and then we'll close the public can influence the speed of this progress through its choices your choice about the products you buy the companies you work for the savings uh, that you have and how they are invested through your pension funds for instance by exercising influence over your pension fund managers that they go in the direction of uh, impact um, investment. Uh, this is a revolution uh, like the tech revolution. It's going to be bottom up and every one of us has a role to play in it. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass back to Charlie now. Thank you, Diana, and thank you, Sir Ronald Cohen. Um, a great call to action there for the role that we can all play in driving this revolution forward. What a fantastic panel, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the breakout Q&A. For those watching, if you have questions, you can log into the Virtual COGX app and post your question there, and I know that Diana will do her best to get through them all. And we're going to wrap up this session now, and we'll be back with you for the next Leadership Stage session very soon. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogex.co.